Hello and welcome to MG Tracy. We're now continuing our tour up the east coast of Florida and today we're at Whitehall. This was once the pride and joy of Henry Flagler. Now if in Britain, if you don't know who he was and you've been to Florida, you owe him a lot. He built a couple of the towns, this one and Miami. He's also responsible for the first major railway line that really opened up Florida for everybody else. And it went right the way down across lots of bridges to the Florida Keys, didn't last very long. Lots of hurricanes kept damaging it. But he built this house in 1902 at the height of his wealth and power. So we're gonna have a wander around and uh, you're welcome to join me. So you find Henry Flagler's name on everything around here, um, from medical centres onwards. And he really is the founder of this town and Miami. And he was the uh, owner and the person who founded Standard Oil. So he was an oil man. And he continued to invest that money in railroads and to open up Florida, as it turns out, to the world. And this was his wonderful house, Whitehall, that opened in 1902. And we're going to have a look round. The press were very excited when this opened and said it was better than many of the palaces in Europe. Well, I'm not sure about that. That sounds like that was someone who had not been to Versailles and Buckingham Palace. But it's certainly a splendid building and it's fantastic that it's been kept. So it's currently $26 for an adult, $13 for a child to have access to the museum. Parking is free and if you time it right there's a guided tour and today's one starts at 12.30. Everywhere you look already you can see wealth. Just look at that seat carved out. It's almost like a bath, isn't it? If you was in oil at the start of the last century, you was in the right commodity. So the property is on water one side and then has this terrific palms that goes back to the road on the other side. Immaculate lawns. I think we're really going to enjoy this video. I'm certainly going to enjoy being here. They're not on the same scale at all, but for me, I'm getting that same exciting feeling as I had when we went to Graceland a couple of years ago to Elvis's ranch. I'll put the link actually below to that if you're interested in that one. It's another amazing place to visit, which has his airlines, his aeroplanes, his cars, his jackets, everything. And you get that same sort of excitement when you come here about to start the tour.
by simply walking through that doorway, we've managed to stroll right into Italy. This is Henry Flagler's library. It is a classic Italian Renaissance design. In the Gilded Age, it was so typical of architects like Carrere and Hastings, who received their formal training in Paris, to bring back to America their favorite designs and set about to recreate them for their American clients. And this is a wonderful example of that. Gilded Age libraries like this were so important because it signified that the owner of this mansion had an intellectual curiosity. Look at the books. Whether or not anyone even opened them is unimportant. You had to have a Gilded Age library like this. Now we can finally meet the Flagler family. Henry Flagler was born in 1830 in a little village in upstate New York in the Finger Lakes. The little village was called Hopewell. His father's name was Isaac Flagler. But he wasn't just Isaac Flagler. He was a lifetime Presbyterian minister but spent his entire ministry as a pastor in small country villages, which meant that money was always difficult. So difficult, so scarce. At the age of 14, Henry Flagler, as a child, perceives himself as becoming a financial burden to his parents. And he asked their permission to leave home and create his life on his own. And for that, they pay him $5 a month, including room and board. Henry Flagler, with a basic eighth grade education, must have had a keen mind for business, because by 1852, he's not a clerk. He's a full partner in the growing family grain business. Now, financially secure, he proposes to and marries the love of his life, one of the Harkness girls, and her name is Mary. They have children, a daughter named Jenny, a son named Harry. Now we know their names, what did they look like? was built by the Caldwell Company of New York City. Caldwell then was America's leading manufacturer of luxury electric lighting. You'll find Caldwell lamps in the, in the Newport mansions. You'll find them in clubs like the Yale Club, Harvard Club, even in some public buildings. You and I would definitely want to have Caldwell lighting in our home. Notice I said electric. Whitehall was electrified the day it opened. That's so insignificant because only about 17% of American homes This is Whitehall's music room. It is French in its decor. It is actually a copy of what you and I might have expected to see and would had we been in Paris in the Gilded Age and walked into an opera house or a music hall. But this design was brought to America and reproduced all around our country in major cities to decorate our music halls and our opera houses. If we lived in the Gilded Age and were together in any major city, You'd say, but Rob, I've seen this before. You really would have, because it was copied many, many times like this. So this is the music room. But it didn't get its name, music room, from that. The name music room comes from what's ahead of us, in front of us. The signature piece is the organ. That organ was built pipes. What none of us can see is behind that wall. That organ has, in total, 1,249 pipes. Then the largest organ ever put into a private residence. The Flaggers hired a professional organist to stay here, live with them during the white hall season, just to play the organ. Before we talk any more about how this beautiful room was used, we just need to quickly revisit the Flagger family. Hopefully most of us could see that little portrait of Mary hidden behind the chandelier, but even if we didn't, Henry Flagger's Mary, when they married in 1853, her health was never that robust. And Mary died at the young age of 47. She never lived to see Whitehall. Henry Flagler has lost his beloved Mary, and he's alone, but not for long. He meets another woman. Within, her name is Ida Alice Rounds. Within two years, Ida Alice and Henry Flagler marry. And the marriage is to be a disaster, unknown to them. Ida Alice begins to show signs of losing her mental competency. This accelerates, she becomes incurably insane and needs to be placed into a sanatorium for her care, and so she is in a private one in Pleasantville, New York. Henry Flagler has now lost his second wife. He's lost Ida Alice, and again, not for long. He meets 
the most charming young Southern belle. Her name is Mary Lily Keenan of Keenanville, North Carolina. She's educated, she's wealthy, she's a gifted theatrist and a classic Southern social. She formed a fortnightly club, fortnightly meaning every two weeks by her invitation, you're here, right here, with her to hear the organ being played and listen to a speaker talk about items of interest to you. Now the final use is the art gallery. This is the Flagler Art, and I invite you out the tour. If you care to, drop back and take a closer look at it. More Caldwell chandeliers, but look how much closer we can see this one. How beautiful it's made. What we didn't see before are these back rack crystals. Not now, but at night they splash the light around the room, making it even more festive. When this house opened in 1902, the Flaggers had a public walkthrough. Everyone was invited to see this beautiful new home, and everybody that could possibly do it came and walked through it. I'm a reporter from the New York Herald Tribune newspaper, standing where we know he stood, because he wrote about it. No one is walking. They're so busy looking at the ceiling, not the mural, which is called Laura. They're looking at a brand new invention they couldn't possibly have ever seen in their life before. It's just now being unveiled. We would walk right by it. Recess lighting, an absolute electrical achievement. Recess lighting. Finally, we can meet Henry Flagler's new bride. Here's her portrait on the south wall. This is Mary Lily at the time of their wedding. If I could ask you to look beyond that gown, the portrait was done, by the way, by Mary Cotton, one of America's leading portrait artists of that era. If I could ask you to look more carefully at the necklace. The necklace is crafted by the Tiffany Company of flawlessly matched Asian pearls, and it measures exactly five feet in length because then that was called an opera length. You might be curious, what if that necklace breaks? Will the pearls scatter on the floor? No, they're knotted between each pearl. That's how you build a quality necklace like that. Choice of art applied to it by the Steinway Company. And we've pushed a little gadget so you can see it more clearly into it. The little gadget in front of it has a big paper roller, has pedals, has a big key to wind it up. That's called a panola. It's the forerunner of the player piano, where we can put them both into one frame. So if the, if the flag is carried through, they can just wind that up and sit here together and enjoy their panola. If you're curious about the organ, it is in perfect tune. We had an organ recital here about three weeks ago on a Sunday, and we do from time to time. And at Christmas time, it'll burst into music again. Let's go on to the to the to the ballroom. Now, watch your step here. There's one little step, and a little step right here. We continue our journey in France. This is the ballroom. It is French in its design. It is really somewhat smaller, but really a copy of what you and I might have seen in Versailles. It is a room designed expressly for entertainment. Look at the art. Look at this beautiful sculpture, the palace sculpture work. More colorful chandeliers are pretty kind of used to those. But the light of the triangle is not that, it's the sconces that are full of them. They look as though they might have been ancient candle driven. Sconces sent from France and electrified. They're not, they're made to look that way by the Caulfield Company. If you look below them, they have beautiful little glass frames and, and shapes below them. Another festive touch. This room was the site of every ball, every social party, every, every activity during the Whitehall season. And this might surprise you. This beautiful home that we're walking through was only used six to eight weeks. That's it. Six to eight weeks, and the social season closed every year like clockwork. I want us to pause briefly here because just a moment ago, we talked about the windows and doors on this side of the ballroom being open to the outdoors, but this isn't the outdoors. That's because where we're standing now is the Whitehall, 
and it never was. If it isn't, what in the world is this? Henry Flagler died at the age of 83, right here at Whitehall in 1913. Mary Lily returned the following year, reopened Whitehall. Wasn't the same without her husband. Mary Lily is still a young woman, and she remarries in 1916, only to die a year later in 1917. She leaves Whitehall to their favorite young niece. She's about 28 years of age. Louise Wise doesn't want Whitehall, she's inherited it. She's never going to use it. She finds a way to rid herself of this obligation. She sells it to a group of developers. Right above our head, where we're standing together, built a 300 room, 10 story hotel called the White Hall. It opened successfully for a while. Never competitive to the flag hotel system, it failed. By the 1950s, it was bankrupt, closed, falling apart. They were going to tear it down, but that would have torn down White Hall. It never happened. Hearing of this, Henry Flagler's granddaughter, Jean, stepped forward, bought everything, carefully demolished the old hotel, and she saved just one piece of it. It's in front of us. This was the hotel dining room. This was the White Hall dining room. We call it our West Room. When the Flagler's lived here, this was outdoors, that was the Rose Garden. We're so fortunate to have this room because we use it for musical events, educational events, and at the peak of the season, you'll find a wedding right off on a Saturday night. And nothing is more charming or beautiful than a white hole wedding in our West Room. We're going on to see more, but before we do this, one more piece of Henry Flagler's hotel resort building we put in front of us. We need to use our imagination for a moment because this doesn't exist. It's 1894. Henry Flagler has built the Royal Ponciana, and he's built the Breakers. He did what he set out to do. He's literally built his resort paradise starting at the tip of northern Florida in St. Augustine. He is now in Palm Beach, and there is no reason to go an inch further. There's nothing south of here but more wilderness, more marsh, more swamp. Also, Henry Flagler has built a railroad. And now, for the first time, Florida is known for its citrus products. But getting citrus out of Florida was a pretty arduous affair. But now we have a railroad. So Henry Flagler's East Coast Railroad can now bring oranges just fresh as can be on his train all the way to the northern cities. For the very first time, you and I can go to a store and pick up a fresh, an orange that's still fresh and it's not even that expensive because Henry Flagler's train is bringing them back and forth until 1895. In 1895, Florida had a record-breaking deep freeze. It destroyed the citrus industry. But something is happening to change Henry Flagler's life yet one more time. Back in Cleveland, Ohio, where he and John D. Rockefeller created Standard Oil, where they lived and worked together, they had a friend, wealthy, now widow. Her name is Julia Tuttle. Julia Tuttle sells all of her holdings in Cleveland, Ohio and moves right here to Southern Florida, but not right here with Henry Flagler. She goes over 60 miles due south into the wilderness, charming, beautiful little place, but remote, called Fort Dallas. At one time, a little fort was there. She buys 640 acres of land, builds a big sprawling house, sets up housekeeping all by herself, and gets thoroughly bored. Starts to pester her friend Henry. Henry, please bring the railroad down here. We can build another resort hotel, it's beautiful. And we can build a support city around it. Henry Flagler has absolutely no interest at all in doing any of that. And then something happened. I can make it up, but I think it'd be fun to think about it like this. It's 1895, the freeze is here. Mary Lily, and I'm sorry, Julia Tuttle is in her kitchen looking out the window. And what she notices is none of her oranges are frozen nor are her flowers. She quickly gathers samples of everything, rushes them all up here to Henry Flagler with a note, and here's the true part, here's the note. Dear Henry, yours froze, mine didn't. <laughs> You'll bring that train down here, we can build a hotel, I will give you half of my property. Henry Flagler's a businessman. By 1897, the beautiful new Royal Palm Resort Hotel opens in yellow and white, just like his other hotels. The wealthy do just what they're supposed to. They come flooding in to Little Fort Dallas. 
in such numbers so quickly, they want to rename Fort Dallas Flagler City. But Henry Flagler won't hear him. Implores them, if we want to rename Fort Dallas, let's name it after the river that flows through it. And the support city we're going to build around it. Let's call our new little city Miami. I know it's hard to grasp this. <laughs> Henry Flagler and Julia Child, and of course others, built the city we now know as Miami. Let's go on to the Grand Wall. still to this day in Europe, still find them at home. Now, we see their different shapes. There's champagne, red wine, white wine, who cares? How would all that work? Across the table, it looks like a great big silver punch bowl, but it isn't. It's called a wine cistern. That one made in London in about 1890, and here was its use. Crushed ice in the center, wine and champagne bottles cantered about so the staff could draw our wine or whatever we want, and refill our glassware. I think we were well lubricated at a guilt day dinner party. Now, first course is served. Nothing gets removed from this table until everybody does their best to complete that course. It is then lifted in unison and replaced with the next course in unison. And this goes on for two and a half to three hours. Dinner finally is over, but our evening isn't. Ladies, you're going right next door with Mary Lily to her drawing room for after dinner conversation for 45 minutes. Gentlemen, we're headed right back to the library, maybe even the billiard room for the same purpose. Never, ever, more than an hour, we find each other, 
We thank the flaggers for a wonderful evening and we quietly exit Whitehall. Let's go see how this beautiful room was used. Watch out for this kind of sticks in our way. Now, 
as we walk from room to room, especially even in the ballroom, it looks kind of dim. But if you lived in the Gilded Age and you were brought up under candles or kerosene or gas, you would have marveled at the consistency of the beautiful lighting all throughout White Wall. Let's make one more stop back in the Grand Hall where we started today. through what was the breakfast room of the hotel, the rest of which was above, has now been demolished and was bolted onto the side of the original house. If you've had a wedding or a function here, perhaps you can send me a message of it, it would be wonderful to hear.
So we're now going to have a wander upstairs. Uh, there's no guide for upstairs, but we're going to wander upstairs. Show you the rest of the amazing building.
the piped heating system which is all over the house and the heat was used to keep everything dry and to preserve the pictures and carpets even though at times it may have been a bit unbearable to heat the house it tended to be used when uh, Mr Flabber wasn't here out of season for him I'm guessing that these stairs here which I've worked off probably went up to the servants quarters Some decent luggage here. I don't do that in Walmart anymore. Heliotrip room. When this was completed in 1902, it had all modern conveniences, if you forgive the pun. And one of those was, of course, to have indoor plumbing. 
So I think, although we can't see them on the tour, it looks like all the rooms were en suite. Master bedroom suite. A lot of building going on again. fitting with the house having every mod con it's got one of those new fangled telephones this master bedroom also has a separate dressing room as well as its own ensuite is the last bedroom on this floor before we go back downstairs. I think there are probably more bedrooms upstairs that were the help. This is the silver maple room with delightful reds and dark browns. It's a very traditional American colour in this of all the dark wood. Not something you find so much in Europe but still popular today here in America. There's another wing here. This is the colonial room. The colonial room is so named because of its colonial revival furniture, a style that became popular around the centennial celebration of American independence in 1876. The bedrooms is now being used for the lace exit. This is the yellow roses room, but well, I bet you can't guess why it's called that.
Originally there were 12 servants rooms on this floor for the household staff. On the third floor where we saw the steps earlier were additional servants rooms for the uh, um, servants of travelling people, guests here. So they would be up on the third floor. Actually a servant's quarters go. It's quite nice. This is the morning room. This small private sitting room was created specifically for Mary Lily Flagler and she used to use it to practice music and letters and correspondence. And listen to some music by the looks of it. of the old hotel. This was his personal train coach that he used when he went down to Key West. This was his view from his garden. Railcar 91 was built in 1886 by the Jackson and Sharp Company for Henry Flagler. It was acquired by the museum in 1959 
and has since been restored. One of the great things about the Henry Franklin Museum and all the year around it, you can have a guided tour or you can have an audio tour. Or you can go around just at your own pace and you're just trusted, which you're not in many stately homes anymore. You know, everything's not behind glass or the evil eye, everybody keep an eye on you. It's refreshing just to pretend you're from that era. That's just about a double bed. They've got the ability to open windows. I don't know quite how that worked though. If uh, you're on a steam train with lots of smoke, if you do, let me know. So you got bed. You've got running water and a toilet. I mean, for the age, must have seemed unbelievable. And you've got your own space here to put your clothes and get your luggage away. All wood everywhere. In this carriage, you've got the wind up mechanism there that allows that bunk bed to be put away. To me, doesn't look that comfortable, and I think I'll probably worry I'm going to roll out of there in the night. Still looks amazing, doesn't it? All the wood. In. So there's the little kitchen here for food prep. Coal in the looks of it. So really you had your own bedroom, a sitting room with a spare bed, a couple of two or three toilets and a kitchen. And then I'll come to the back. Amazing rail car. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. It all really helps me. I'll see you in the next video. coconut grove remaining and they were all along Palm Beach originally hence its name Last coconut grove in Palm Beach. 
Hi, I hope you found that useful. It's certainly I've learned a lot about the history of Florida. There's a lot more to Florida when you're out here than just Mickey Mouse and Orlando, and I hope you get a chance to look around. 